board member. I'm glad to see the energy that he and his staff have brought to the to that group because frankly for a while we weren't sure that CWC was going to persist and it's nice to see them in a renaissance of sorts now. Um, Greg's also on City Planning Commission and a commissioner on the environment of the county and all around good guy and uh, just brings a lot of good energy to the watershed so I'm, I'm really stoked to have Greg be part of this nowadays. I think it's helpful for, first of all, good morning everyone. Good morning. I think it's helpful for presenters and for all of you to know who's here. Who on a soggy Saturday morning, on a busy day, just like every busy day, who decided to come and learn about the San Lorenzo River? I think you already learned something from um, Chris, shared some tidbits about the river and the watershed that I bet you didn't know all those bits. But I'm curious, raise your hand if you're at the fire station for the first time. Okay, maybe more than half of us. Raise your hand if you're at your first San Lorenzo River Symposium. Good number, we've had four. Raise your hand if you've been to two symposia. Who's been to three of them? And keep your hand up if you've been to all four. All right, some watershed geeks here. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Chris mentioned that this is our fourth. Um, the first one, we basically just had a general symposium. They, Symposium. The idea, as Chris said, was to learn about science, and, and that's kind of a foundational piece we want to invest in all of our scientific understanding for the public and for everyone. The sec um, and the other topics included flow and the lagoon, and this one is called hot topics. And those are the topics that we'll be covering today include sediment, um, fire, cannabis, and atmospheric rivers. So you're going to hear more a lot about that. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about the cards that are on your chairs. We, the planning, com uh, planning team that Chris mentioned, as you can uh, imagine, we want to know how to make this as useful for you as possible. So write on your card feedback that you have. What did you love? What did you hate? And also that card is for you to give a question to any of the presenters. Uh, research, uh, who's going to collect the cards? Chris Berry, who you just saw, and Jen Nicholson from San Lorenzo Valley Water District. It'll be easy enough for you to um, write on the cards and find them, and then we'll collect those cards, and we'll have two different sessions where we'll have break uh, questions, um, and, and we'll go through those. So give us feedback, evaluation, and questions you have, and they'll be answered later. And with that, I'm going to get to our introduction of our first speaker. Assemblymember Stone, Mark Stone, uh, loves the outdoors and he loves the, wa the water. He has a number of water feats. He's an ocean owner, open ocean swimmer and he loves to get into the water. I don't think he swims the river much, but he may sh share tales about that. He represents the 29th Assembly District, which includes portions of Santa Cruz, Santa Clara, and Monterey counties. I've heard him say before that he really loves the fact that, you know, after the, an Assembly member's name, it says um, their district, and he loves the fact that it says California Assembly, Monterey Bay. He's really proud of that. Um, Mark is going to talk to us today, his title is Restoring the San Lorenzo River in the Face of Climate Change, Federal Deregulation, and Competing Land Uses. As our first speaker of the morning, let's give him some, a really warm welcome to Assemblymember Mark Stone. So that's quite a title to the talk. And of course, I'm a politician, so I know nothing about any of that, and it's really more about <laughs> about implementing policy that I actually learned over the years from a lot of you. John Ricker, when he came in, said, you're going to give us some wise words from Sacramento. And I thought, boy, if that's not an oxymoron, then I don't know what is. So I don't know that I can do that. But I, I, I do want to share a little bit about where, we're, where things stand sort of in Sacramento with respect to watersheds. The rant here, we've had this conversation a lot, and I keep finding out that we have been having conversations here that statewide have, are just starting to happen, and we've been having them for quite a bit of time because we live on a very short watershed, a very impacted watershed, watershed with a lot of histories, probably the, some of the highest concentrations of septic in the country, and our water issues are acute, and we've been fighting over them and solving them for a long time. Not so true across the rest of the state. And in fact, when we do land use and watershed planning, we tend to ignore where that water ends up in the ocean. 
And when we do ocean policy and planning, we ignore where the water comes from, and that's the land. And we're starting to understand that a little bit better because obviously watersheds not only affect us on a daily basis, it's where we get our water, it's where our habitats are, it's where we, sort of, we, we want to live and surround ourselves with water, but also has a tremendous impact out into the ocean. And lo and behold, a lot of the changes happen in the ocean are in fact land-based, with land-based inputs. We just found out that one of the greatest concentrations of freshwater toxins flowing out into the ocean is, of all places, the Carmel River. Well, why would that be? They suspect it's because of a lot of the nutrients put into golf courses, and that seems to be feeding algae that are flowing. There we go. Is that working? Okay, flowing out into the ocean, and the algae that create the toxins, the freshwater algae die when they hit the ocean, but the toxins don't. So again, we're just learning about some of these impacts that we probably should have been aware of a long time ago. And our fetch is so short on the, on the San Lorenzo River and so many people living on it that we've, I think, been a little bit more aware. On the, I'm glad there's some fisheries folks in here as well, because one of the huge fights in California is over water supply. And should we build more dams? Do we divert more water? For, out for agriculture, and a lot of my colleagues, their perspective is all of the water that flows out of the San Francisco Bay into the ocean is a waste. Well, if we don't have water in our rivers, and in our estuaries, and upstreams in our watersheds, then we're not doing our jobs as we manage the habitat, and the fisheries, and all that that represents. And so that's been starting to be a shift in an understanding as we head into droughts, and yes, it's raining today, but we're going to head more into drought over the years. The patterns are changing with climate change, which means the snow patterns are less. I know we don't get much snow here, but a lot of the state relies on the snowpack as the largest single water, uh, water storage system that we have. So if we lose the snowpack, then the timing of water for the system is different. Even if we get the same amount of precipitation, which is not necessarily guaranteed. So all of our systems are set up very, very differently than where we seem to be headed with climate change. And we have to think about that. And what's the answer? The answer ultimately is putting time and money and effort into restoring and managing our watersheds. Talk to the water district here, talk to the county, talk to anybody engaged in watersheds. They know that. That how we keep water in our watersheds that and keep water in the ground <laughs> It is the most effective way of managing that system. That's what's most important, whether it's for human consumption, whether it's for fisheries, whether it's for, for habitat, or just holding on to our beautiful environment. Those are very, very critical notions. State's kind of just beginning to come around to that. And we see some, some very big successes now. The Rogue River, it was just reported, seeing an incredible amount of salmon coming back into the Rogue River because of a lot of restoration that they've done up there. We're hopeful for the Klamath. And as we implement the Coho Recovery Plan in the Sacramento River, San Joaquin River, and then marching south, who knows, maybe we can start to see those salmonids come back into our river systems to the extent that they'll never come back the way that they had been, but maybe start to see some of them come back into our systems. That's healthy for the fishing industry, yes. It's healthy for our plate because I think all of us probably enjoy salmon, but it's also a sign that if we can manage that, then we're starting to do the right things with respect to our watersheds, how we manage them, how we pay attention. So that's what's critical here. That's what's really important here, is to look locally, but also think more broadly about what's working, what's not working in, in other areas. And as I work in Sacramento, I keep bringing up lessons I've learned from a lot of you in this room, about perspectives on how we do things here, that are lessons that need to be understood better across the state. So I thank all of you for your work, for your attention. Our little watershed is very critical, but it's all we have. We're not connected to the state system, we're not connected to the federal system. So if we're not managing our water appropriately, there's really no place else to go, and there's not going to be any other place to go. So it's an acute issue, it's a strong issue, I know you're all very passionate about it. It's great to see this many people come out on a drizzly Saturday morning to talk about watersheds that are so important to our life and, and to our world. And it is nice to come to Zyani, and I know, Chris, you live up in the valley. I did an event here probably back in 04, and the newspaper 
local newspaper reporters were complaining, how come I was having this, an event so far in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> well, that, that was sort of astonishing. Somebody, I guess, had never really left the city limits of Santa Cruz. You know, to me and to those in the valley, this is only really part way up. There are much more remote places in our little valley that we, that we all know of and, and love. So enjoy the day. There's a lot of good information. It looks like a, a great symposium. I'm glad looking at the success of this for four years and many, many more to come. So congratulations, enjoy the day, and uh, participate, learn, share what you know. Thank you. So I'm moderating much of the day. There's a switch on it. So I'll moderate much of the day. Can you still hear me in the back? Yeah. I'll moderate, but as uh, the assembly member is an elected official, he's used to handling a crowd. So I'm going to let Mark take some questions and answers from the crowd because he has a few minutes. So just let him do that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, any questions that I can answer? I'll say, come on, this is not a shy crowd. <laughs> I'm just curious what the state can do uh, for environmental regulatory protection in the context of deregulation on the federal level. Can you state that to some people? So, yeah, the question is, we've started to see some very significant rollbacks in federal environmental regulation. What can the state do? And the state's environmental protection is built on the federal rules, either statutes or regulations. And so we have passed... The, the state framework goes often further than what the federal framework does, but relies on that system of laws and regulations. As they roll it back, that leaves some very serious gaps in what we would consider as the protections that we expect in California. So the state agencies each are looking at, in their jurisdictional area, what the federal government is doing, what their impacts are, and where we need to then backfill, if you will, regulations or statutes in order to ensure that we have continuity in our programs here in California. Hard to tell exactly right now what that is. There was a bill last year, SB 54, that didn't pass, it's still technically alive, that was trying to force the state agencies to do exactly that. It was well intended but very problematic in its implementation. But I think the agencies recognize the need, but until until we really understand what's being rolled back, what that looks like, and where we need to fill in. They will be communicating to us. They will probably be doing their own regulatory rulemaking if they need to. So we're, we're watching that very closely. What else? Nancy? Can you um, just briefly say what the current regulations are and, and support system that's coming from the state for local organizations and agencies working on climate change? And do you see anything in your crystal ball coming up? So the question is about climate change and supports of the, the state government to, to local and local agencies. There has been, with the, the water bond, with a lot of the, the state monies, there's a large climate change component to it. Unfortunately, a lot of the climate change work that's being done in the state is around greenhouse gas mitigation and reduction. And that's very, very important. But we also know we're kind of past the tipping points, if you will. And there are changes that are coming that we're starting to, to look at and recognize that California is going to need to adapt to. And that becomes very, very difficult at a local level. In fact, the Ocean Protection Council just came out with its sea level rise guidance. And that guidance is really guidance to state agencies, but also local agencies of how to look at the, your planning functions with respect to sea level rise and assess the risks of, of what that means. I keep telling the, the state we've done some planning, we've done some databases, there's good information out there, but so far there's not a lot of good resources, which is what's going to be necessary in the next phases to help local jurisdictions move infrastructure, make land use decisions, rethink where all of the, the public and private risks are for, for really what's coming. 
This state leads the world in the conversation around greenhouse gas reduction. In fact, the next major world conference is going to be in San Francisco, not sponsored by the United States, but sponsored by the state of California. And we are inviting countries from all over the world to come to a climate symposium, talk about next steps, and showcase what California has been doing. So a lot of countries in the world look to us. We put together a consortium around ocean chemistry, ocean acidification, and there are probably 10 or 12 member countries and the state of California. But we've also engaged Oregon, Washington, and other states who are willing to participate in that conversation because as the, as the climate impacts come and ocean chemistry changes, that has very, very serious impacts on our fisheries, on wildlife, on how the ocean habitats function. So we're looking at the top level. There's not necessarily a lot of supports other than in bonds, which are starting to recognize the need for adapting and managing climate on the local level. Uh, our job should be to keep money and flexibility going down to local agencies, especially those who are willing to tackle it. What else can I answer? Yes, sir. So you, excuse me, you mentioned that our, our state depends on snowpack and the timing of when you know, we get it and whether that's, we can rely on that on the future. It, it strikes me that you know, we're, the federal things that are going on and then competing interests, it's all going to boil down to something about water storage, water redistribution, or water capture. What, just what are you thinking about? Where's, how are we going to get through all that to figure something out that is going to work for most everybody? So the question is, is how do we design a system, given the changes that are happening, that's going to work for most everybody across the state? That's a very, very loaded question. Very, very complex. There are a number of interests that they think the right answer is to build a few more reservoirs a few more dams, and that's what's going to solve the problem, and it won't. Even the capacity of the dams that are proposed is not going to solve much of the problems, and they bring a whole host of other issues with them if we're talking about building more reservoirs in California. The single largest reservoir we have, obviously, is the ground, and or the groundwater basins, but unfortunately those are becoming increasingly impacted. The snowpack is critical. And we have built the system, the federal and the state water distribution systems, on the timing of the snow melt as it comes down. So as we get water that is not snow in the Sierras, it's important to manage those watersheds differently than they have been in a way that, that slows down that water so we, we retain it in the system as high up as possible for as long as possible, and then distribute it down. There are a lot of local areas are starting to do groundwater storage and recharge and really look at what other mechanisms they have locally in order to store and then bring the water out as it's necessary. And then, of course, 80% of the water is used in California by agriculture and by industrial uses, and most of that is agriculture. And yet all of the water savings through the last drought were done at the residential level, which is 20%. And my, I was recently talking to one of my colleagues from L.A. They were very proud that L.A., and it's, re, it's reversing right now, but at one point they were down to, I think, 100 gallons per person per day, and they were very proud of that. Uh, when was the last time you ever saw 100 gallons per person per day as an average? Well, we're down around half of that around the entire Monterey Bay. So there's different standards, different thoughts about what responsibility means. <laughs> And if we cannot, which we have not been successful in engaging our agricultural partners in water savings, then we're, we're missing the biggest component. And I will say for ag around the Monterey Bay, because again, we're not connected to the state or federal water projects, and if you drive down by Castroville and you see those very large purple pipes, what does purple pipe mean? Reclaimed water. Throughout the summer, 75% of the agricultural irrigation water around the Castroville area is reclaimed water. They have sensors in their fields so that they know water moisture content in, the, in their fields. They're watering what they need, when they need. Those are best practices. Those are some very good ways to manage water. That's not happening across the state. And I think we need to, to think more broadly than just imposing water restrictions on the residential sector and can use that more broadly in all the other sectors as we're working on that. So I'd say I've got one more other question. Yes, sir. Speaking of dams, are there any uh, large 
large dams that are slated? Are there serious discussions about going in or getting taken down in the next five, ten years or so in California? So the question is about dams in California and whether there are plans for those. There's always some talk about removing some dams, and in, especially in, in impacted areas, one of the largest was way up the Carmel River. The San Clemente Dam was taken out a year or so ago. That, that project was complete. There's the, I forget the names of the sites, Reservoir, and then there's one other uh, that is on the books as a potential, and that's in Northern California. In the latest water bond package that we put together, there was, I think it was seven to $8 billion that was reserved for storage projects. But if you read the language, it's all about Central Valley and Sacramento River and San Joaquin River tributaries. So even if we had storage projects that we could have, which is even potentially reclaiming capacity in storage systems, connecting reservoirs, existing reservoirs like uh, San Antonio and Nascimento in Monterey County, none of those are eligible for the water storage money that's there, that $8 billion, that's reserved for Central Valley. Highly contentious. I'm not pleased with that outcome because we do have some things that we could do. And if you look at the existing reservoir system, we could reclaim 25%, 30% if we just restored the took the sediment out of some of those reservoirs. Uh, there's also gold and, and other valuable minerals in there, so I don't know that it would even cost the state that much money if you give mineral rights to some of those folks is, you know, excavate them and give us back that capacity. That's much less expensive. Those are things we should be thinking about before, I think, anyway, before we start building new reservoirs just to build new reservoirs there. There is plenty of capacity and plenty of capacity in the ground across the state to be able to help answer that storage question, as, as well as real water conservation uh, across all sectors that are using water. All right, very good to hear this. Thank you, Assemblymember Stone. Um, Mark said he can stay for a little bit, so if you have other questions, I know you may have questions for him, uh, find him in the back. Stay with us for a little bit, and I'll remind you about questions in general. Uh, each speaker won't take questions like Mark just did. We'll be taking, collecting the cards, like I said. Assemblymember Stone mentioned that it's a pretty short watershed. I have a trivia question. Now, I have to. There's an honor system here. If you're a professional and you know this really easily, don't don't answer the question. But how long is the San Lorenzo River? Raise your hand. You know that answer. Tom. One, oh my gosh, 29, 24 miles. That's right, 29, 29 miles ish. So you get a lock home and have it. So we have some trivia sprinkled throughout the day. The next speaker is Amy East. She is a research geologist at the U.S. Geological Survey Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center. Uh, raise your hand if you knew there was a USGS office in Santa Cruz. Not everybody, but most of you. I thought so. Amy um, studies how landscapes change over time and responds to factors such as changing climate, sediment supply, and human land use. The title of her talk is San Lorenzo River Response to Intense Atmospheric River Activity on the Central California Coast in 2017. Let's warm up the lectern for Amy East. Yeah, in addition to the, um, the work that I'm going to be talking about today, I also get to do a lot of...